So we're live. So this Hopefully shared. this is what's showing up. Yeah, the audio is on. If you turn the audio on, it's going to switch to me. that audio on, and then we'll switch this audio on. You might be able to use Soundflower. Okay. This, this one is the one. This is the one that's streaming the video, right? Face. Right. This one's streaming the screen. This one's streaming the screen. Okay. Mr. Audio Feed. Hello, hello, hello. It's going to be perfect. I just had to move the screen this. We need to test audio from the studio, okay? 
because they hooked up like the audio down. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Catholic Fest 2013. We're excited you're here. There's still going to be a few people trickling in. That's totally fine. We're going to go over just some basic housekeeping things before we start. First off, for your CME, uh, we don't want piles of paper this year. We're going to send you all a link. Uh, that you can fill out. If you, if you want to put it on paper and hand it to us, that's totally fine. We're going to send you a link that you can fill in which days you're out here, how many hours that you're here as well. We want to thank the University of Kentucky and Marshall Emergency Services and Mason Medical Group for helping us pay for some of the costs of the castle. It's an expensive event to put on and we couldn't have done it without them. And also, there's no way we could have done this without all the machines. We have 24 state-of-the-art machines thanks to Mine Ray Phillips and Sonosite. There should be plenty of machines for everybody. That's not going to be a problem. They, they're the kind of machines everywhere. You'll be tripping over sixty, seventy, hundred thousand dollar machines if you're not careful. Also, I think of medical students. We've got medical student models. A lot of them have a farm test in a few days, and they're here anyway, modeling for you. So be sure and tell them thank you. Uh, and they're trying to learn some too. So talk out loud if you're learning. They're going to be learning also. They're excited to be here. And we're excited to have them. We've got some. We've got ten fellowship trained instructors as well as some other. Instructors as well. You're going to notice them because they're going to be wearing party hats. Some of our instructors that you won't notice otherwise. That was a nice way to both humiliate them and make sure that you know who they are. So the instructors that are here that you know, you know, but there are some that you're not going to probably recognize. So they'll have some party hats on for you, make it a little bit easier. This is our our uh, shirt this year. Mike show them our lovely shirt. Now this is Castle Fest. You don't just get the shirt; you have to earn the shirt. All right. So. 
the instructors are going to have little tickets that they'll hand you if you earn a shirt. You have to identify a common wildlife or answer a question for them. And you get this, in, and you get one shirt. These are nice shirts. I'm going to give you eight of these for, for uh, identifying eight common wildlife. We also have some limited edition shirts each day. Today, <laughs> this is our limited edition shirt. We just have a couple of these. So you're going to have to do something actually extra special to get this. We have one for an online, this is, this is stream live, hopefully we actually don't know if it's working right now. It's hopefully stream live, it looks like it is. Um, and everyone here, everyone, so everyone online has a chance to win and you guys can win as well. The way you do this is by interacting. Uh, we're going to have live tweets going here. If you tweet with the hashtag CF2013, either you're tweeting um, a point that, that one of the instructors made or if you have a question. You can watch this from the other room or people on live can on people live online can watch this as well and tweet your questions. We're going to be monitoring those and answering those. If it's a question that everybody needs an answer to, maybe we can stop the presenter and ask them to clarify what they just said. So the best tweet of the day, either a summary of what someone said or a question or answer from someone here live and then as well as someone online will win the limited edition, the read shirt today. There's the hashtag CF2013. Tonight, we're going to the Woodford Reserve. You guys should be excited. It's an incredible place. Uh, we're going to leave from here about 5, then we'll have tours there, and we'll have a nice dinner. With uh, They usually don't run out of bourbon, so we should be OK there uh, as well. This is just a reminder that our goal is for this to be the most incredible educational experience ever. We also want it to be just a great experience in general. We've got several people that are here specifically. Uh, I don't see them now. Actually, I was hoping they were going to be just back there to raise their hand and show you who they are. We'll identify them later. If you have any problems, anything related to your stay, travel, anything, let Mike or I know or one of our special concierge know as well and we'll get you taken care of. I know a lot of you, some of you from out of country um, or just out of town. This is what we want to encourage you to do if you're willing. We, we have the model, models that are here already. Some of them are already stationed. And we're right now we're streaming this live into a couple of the rooms. So if you want, we would encourage you to actually, during the talks, go in the other room, find a model, watch, but also scan in real time to practice this. And then if you've got a question that somebody in the room can answer, tweet it. We'll come into here and we'll either come answer it or we'll answer it real time and we'll tweet back to you wherever you are. So one question we did want to address here is, why are you here? I mean, not why are you in Brussels, Kentucky, but why are you at Castle Fest? And my guess is that I'm sort of preaching the choir here. I think we all know that ultrasound is going to change everything that we really know about medicine. It's the future of medicine in a lot of ways. And not everybody really believes that. There are a lot of people out there that disagree with us, that think that ultrasound is just another fad, it's going to go away. And some of these quotes here suggest that. How about this one up top? That it will ever come into general use, notwithstanding its value, is extremely doubtful because it is beneficial application requires much time and gives a good bit of trouble both to the patient and the practitioner because its hue and character are foreign and opposed to all our habits and associations. Or what about this one? Clinicians will not take kindly to accepting changes that are detrimental to existing working processes unless they are significant improving benefits. So I'm kind of messing with you here a little bit because this first quote is from 1834 and the second quote is from a guy named Lewis A. Connor who is the founder of the American Heart Association. These comments were all about the stethoscope. Something that we use on a daily basis, with, or used to use on a daily basis, until I have ultrasound. And I think it's impressive to me it, it, that this is sort of, this is a common theme in medicine. Whenever we introduce something new, people, people can disagree with it, people can try to fight it, but it just takes a little time and it's going to catch on. There are lots of people out there that still feel this way, though. Some of our ultrasound leaders actually still feel this way. Like, look at this quote. Ultrasound is the lamest, most uncool thing I've ever wasted my time learning. Some of the people that you may respect in ultrasound have recently just gotten on the man wagon. <laughs> so just a couple, of, a couple of ideas here about why ultrasound is going to make you a better doctor. The first thing I'd like to address is improving patient satisfaction. This is a study here that looked at the patient satisfaction scores on patients who uh, were randomized to either receiving an ultrasound or not an ultrasound when they presented to the emergency department with abdominal pain. You can see there's a significant increase in patients who got the actual ultrasound. They were happier about their care. Not only that, but in the same study, they also showed they had um, less further examinations 
in CT or ultrasound at uh, initially on the fr uh, first presentation and at six months. So not only can we improve patient satisfaction, we can actually decrease res resource utilization. So why do patients like it when you ultrasound them? Well, there's a few reasons. For one thing, you're spending more time at the bedside, right? The actual procedure itself takes more time. So you're at the bedside, talking with the patient, communicating with them, sometimes you even get more information out of the history that you wouldn't have gotten because you're flying through your history to see the 15 other patients you have on board. Also, you're touching the patient more. So you're actually you're putting your hand on the patient because you're ultrasounding them. Patients like that. They like the feeling of touch they get in position. You're obviously assuming more up to date using this procedure that not a lot of doctors know, and not everybody gets an ultrasound when they go into the emergency department, so they think you're doing the And you're more likely to show the patients images of pathology. So you're going to actually show them on their screen. Here's your gallstones. Here's your pericardial effusion. Here's your hypotension and shock. Here's, you know, <laughs> see right here, you can see your heart is obviously not filling. Uh, so there's, I mean, there's, there's lots of more communication because of ultrasound. Not only that, but ultrasound is also going to save you time, and time is equal to money, right? Here's one study by Mike Blytus that showed that just by diagnosing IUP in the emergency department, we can decrease the stay for a first trimester bleeding patient by an hour and 17 minutes. And I know what you're saying, maybe you can't trust Black Mike Blytus, I mean, who trusts that guy anyway, right? Well, what about these three studies right here? They say the exact same thing. At the University of Utah right now, we're doing a study where we're actually trying to implement a lean project and decrease uh, the amount of time that patients with cholelithiasis stay in our emergency department. So in order to do that, we've uh, actually stopped performing radiology and performed scans on these patients. So our bedside ultrasound is used to take the patient directly to the OR. And in our, in our study so far, we've seen a decrease in ER, ER stay times by almost three hours just by using ED ultrasound as opposed to radiology ultrasound. And if you don't really believe time is money, then how about this study? This is one of my favorites. This one actually just looks at if we just replace the ED ultrasound for the radiology ultrasound for, for cholelithiasis, we could save $63 million annually. In addition, we can improve outcomes. This is a really impressive study that Dr. Melnicker did. This is the, one of the SOAP trials uh, for the Sonography Outcomes Assessment Program. And what they did is they just basically randomized patients who, are in, who had trauma to either receiving an ultrasound or not receiving an ultrasound. That's all they did. That was the intervention. And by doing that, they found that those patients who had an ultrasound went to the OR in 64% less time, had fewer CTs, spent 27% less time in the hospital, had fewer complications, and 35% cheaper. Not only that, but the AHRQ released in 1998 a best practices guideline. So one of 11 best practices to reduce errors in medical procedures, they cited ultrasound for the placement of central lines. They found that ultrasound was cheaper, had less complications, was faster and caused less infections. That's not a blowing statement, I don't know what is. A relative risk reduction of 78% for ultrasound. Think about that. That's thousands of sticks. All of that patient discomfort that you're decreasing just by using ultrasound in one single procedure. Not only that, but the average malpractice claim for a complication from a central line placement is up to $100,000. You don't believe me, there's 39 studies that basically argue that same point. And then finally, ultrasound can save lives. A Cochrane review released recently suggested that we could uh, we had an odds ratio of decreasing mortality of 0.6% if all we do is just screen men over the age of 65 who have had a history of smoking for AAA. If we do that, we're going to catch more AAAs, we're going to send them to the OR, we're going to decrease their mortality. So in summary, I think we, it's safe to say that ultrasound is uh, safer, it saves lives, makes patients happier, it's cheaper, and improves ED billing. Really, what's not to love about it? Finally, I want to just close with this one quote that I really like. Uh, this was uh, from Robert Fisher in Ian News in 2010. I have 35 years experience in emergency medicine. I trained by taking 40 hours of didactics and hands-on courses and doing training exams on patients while on the job. Nothing I've learned in the past 35 years has been so useful, exciting, and revolutionary to me at bedside ultrasound. I would rather retire than go to work without having this modality ready to use daily. I think that speaks, speaks uh, massively to what we're trying to do here. All right, everybody loves evidence, sure. Um, and we all try to practice evidence-based medicine, but I've got to be honest, the reason that I'm passionate about bedside ultrasound is the patients that I see every day this makes a tremendous difference in their lives, in their families' lives. So I want to tell you just a real quick story that I just had from a shift not very long ago at all, but it just, was, it just perfectly epitomizes why uh, I'm passionate about bedside ultrasound. It was basically a night shift when I was on single coverage. I was there by myself at the University of Kentucky. 
Um, and it started with a trauma patient that came in. Uh, it was a young lady. She was in her 20s. She looked like she was hurt pretty badly, but she was stable. Her vital signs were fine. Um, we really were worried that she had a, a pretty good chest injury. So our primary survey was okay. She was still stable after the chest x-ray pelvis and the bedside ultrasound. And we looked at her lungs. That's what we were worried about, obviously. And she had pretty good lung sliding, probably a pulmonary contusion, but no pneumothorax. At that point, she was stable enough. We sent her to the CT scanner. We got a call from radiology then that she had a pneumothorax. It was a really small pneumothorax. And it actually said to us, well, it's probably not big enough to even do anything about it. It's a tiny little thing. We were a little concerned, though, because when we looked, we hadn't seen one. So we were worried that maybe this was evolving, getting bigger. So we went back to the bedside immediately when she returned and looked again, and she definitely had a pneumothorax now, no lung sliding. We looked along her chest, and it was looked like a sizable one now. So this is getting bigger. So we knew, based on our bedside ultrasound, that she needed you know, that she needed a chest tube right then. And even though on the radiology the CT scan, it wasn't so clear. So we got everything ready to put the chest tube in. And I got a call on over sitting on both Sarah at that time that we got a 90-year-old coming in Cody now. So I felt a little bad about leaving the intern to do the chest tube by herself, but she's a great intern. So it was uh, the right thing to do. We had some coming in without a pulse. So I went to meet this elderly patient. Um, and my plan with her was when we get these patients in, first thing I do is take a look at their heart. A 90-year-old, no pulses, there's no cardiac activity. We're not going to do a lot of unnecessary things to, to this, to this uh, poor lady. We're not going to prolong this. There's uh, never been cardiac standstill on arrival had good neurologic outcome that's been reported in the literature yet, especially in the 90-year-old. So when she rolled in, the first thing we noticed actually it was, was that her abdomen was distended. So that was a little strange. And the EMS told us as they were rolling her in, her belly's been getting bigger the whole time we've been bringing her in doing these compressions. So I looked immediately, instead of at her heart, we just stuck it on her belly as they're moving over. And her abdomen's full of fluid, full of fluid. So she may have a reversible cause at this point. So then we started thinking, all right, did we activate a massive transmission protocol for this 90-year-old with no pulse? Kind of a tough decision. Um, and right as we were thinking about that, I got another call on, on the Vercera that we got a two-month-old from the end coding. So this is everyone's worst nightmare. We immediately want to go to, to wait on this two-month-old. Do we possibly have a reversible injury here? So then we moved the probe up to her heart, and this is what we saw. She had absolutely no cardiac activity, cardiac standstill. So that made the decision very easy for us that this is the right thing to do to let her have as natural of a death as we can at this point. Um, and not do a lot of unnecessary things to her. We immediately turned our attention to the two-month-old. When we went to meet EMS for the two-month-old, I was pretty hopeful. What I had heard is that they were trying to intubate, but they weren't able to, which for me, that gave me a little bit of hope because I thought, all right, get a tube in, get some oxygen going, we'll get this heart back. Two-month-old's heart wants to be, it wants to live. We intubate her, it'll be fine. So they arrived, sure enough, they had not intubated her. Um, the later quickly. I didn't look at her heart immediately at this point because I thought we we're going to get her back. Uh, we got her intubated easily. Next pulse check, no pulse. So we resume compressions. Again, I, I want to minimize the compression pause as much as possible. So I didn't look at her heart again. I still thought we we're going to get her back just another round. The parents were there at the time. The EMS told us that when they arrived, it was actually, uh, they never had a pulse. So that was worrisome. Never had a pulse, didn't have a pulse on arrival. And I told the parents at that time, this looks pretty bad. Um, we're going to do everything that we can, but this looks uh, pretty bad based on the information we have right now. So they left the room. A couple more rounds, we still didn't have a pulse. So at that point, I mean, this is definitely time to take a look at her heart, see what else is going on here. Something's not, not, not making sense. So when I looked at her heart after this has been going on for a little while, this is what I saw. I think she had great squeeze. This looks like she has a pulse. So I'm like, great, we've got a pulse back. We feel no one can feel a pulse. None of us can feel a pulse, so what do you do when you don't have a pulse and you resume compression? So that's what we did. But I was very confused at this point. So we had another round, looked again, no one could feel a pulse, but I saw this image again. At that point, I remembered a study that I, I had kind of heard about, but didn't really know much about, about uh, rescuer palpation of pulses in pediatric patients. And I didn't remember the number, but I knew it wasn't great. 78% accuracy in pulse palpation for pediatric arrests. But I remembered this kind of concept. And so I thought, maybe, maybe my echo is better than us filling, the, filling her pulses. So then at the next round, 
we get is we actually get a Doppler out. We actually got a little Doppler that we they get for pulses sometimes in extremity fractures. Put it on the femoral, and she had a great pulse. We took a pressure, and she had a pressure. She was actually alive, but we still couldn't actually feel the pulse. This was pretty troubling to me since at that point she had been there 30 minutes. We never felt the pulse. She'd never had a pulse about EMS. And I kind of thought, what would have happened if I hadn't had ultrasound at that point? What would have happened to this patient? in the past if I was practicing somewhere where I didn't have a machine. So when I went to talk to this family, um, I don't want to be I don't want to be over dramatic about this, but I have a one year old and I have a three year old daughter. And when I went and, and looked this family in the eyes and told them that your daughter is actually alive, um, the emotion that came over me most was just thankfulness that actually practice in a time and with the technology that makes me better than I would be otherwise. And so that's why I'm passionate about Betsy Ultron, because this is not an isolated case. We, we see this make a difference in patients' lives all the time. And actually, as I, as I look out to all of you today, I'm actually just as thankful. And I think about the thousands of patients that you are going to affect by learning this, committing to it the next several days. No, I mean, I don't know if we need to give them a hard sell right now. Maybe right. 30 minutes into the right, conference right. is a little early. So enough emotion, enough evidence. <laughs> we'll get into some education, all right? Uh, our first talk is going to be Mike Stone. Mike actually wanted to do his own introduction, so um, so Mike, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I was actually going to do your introduction. Uh, I don't know if that would be okay. <laughs> it's an honor today to be introducing Mike Stone. Uh, Mike is well, uh, Mike, Mike is a, a good friend, and uh, and obviously Matt Dawson and I have been working with him a good bit recently on the podcast and a lot of other things. And uh, I I feel very, very Honored to Mike because uh, he's such a such a leader in ultrasound. I mean, he's really he's famous worldwide, um, and, and I'm not just joking. He, he really does uh, know his stuff, and he's done a lot of stuff in ultrasound. Uh, just a little bit of history. Mike uh, got his uh, went to medical school at New York University, uh, did his residency and fellowship at Highland, and since then has had quite a few jobs in a very short uh, time frame. And in New Jersey, uh, at Downstate, the Highland, and then and now he's at the Brigham, which he just started recently. Mike uh, is uh, currently the chief of emergency ultrasound at the Brigham and the fellowship director. He's also the immediate past chair of the ASAP ultrasound section. And he's won, won tons of awards uh, from CORD, SAM, uh, and just about every place he's ever teached and any place you've ever been to before, including Highland, Sun, uh, SUNY Dallas State, uh, and Kings County. He's a regular on the ultrasound podcast. You can follow him at Bedside Sono uh, on uh, Twitter. Uh, he's been on EM Rap, and he's got a pretty active uh, Vimeo page. He was instrumental in the creation of SonoCloud. Uh, he is a closet surgeon, and uh, he is also a self-professed uh, family guy. So, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm really honored to be here to be introducing Mike. And as I was sort of putting this this talk together, I was trying to think, you know, what is it about Mike that I can sort of impart on everyone that's unique? And uh, I think one thing that I've really learned about him is the guy is always wearing a suit. Uh, every time I've seen him. And with the exception of the last two days setting up here at Tassel Fest, the man has been in a suit. So I sort of thought to myself, you know, I don't know anybody else like that who's always wearing a suit. What is it about Mike? What is it about his history that's led him to be in a suit? So we did a little bit of research, and I went back to, uh, got some old pictures here. So it looks like when, when Mike was born, he was in fact not wearing a suit. Although the first child ever to be born with a giant hat on, he was not actually wearing a suit at the time. Uh, we didn't have a lot of pictures during his childhood, but then in residency, it appears that he he didn't wear much clothing at all. He actually just worked out a lot. Uh, we see here uh, at New Jersey, uh, clearly not a suit. Uh, here in SUNY, he was starting to get a little suitish. You, know, you can see a little bit of a collar there uh, next to his neck, but not quite wearing the full suit. Moving back to Highland, uh, and uh, here's me wearing somewhat of a suit, although a little bit disheveled. 
And then here at uh, the Brigham, he's uh, clearly uh, wearing his suit and looking very appropriate. So uh, Mike Stone, if you would like to take the slow walk up, and I'll duck in front. So we, we joked it out earlier about who would get to do the really fun introduction and who would talk about physics. And I won. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk about physics, everybody's favorite part of an ultrasound conference. I always kind of wondered why we set conferences up like this where you guys travel, travel sometimes long distances and um, you can't be all enthusiastic about incorporating ultrasound into your clinical practice and becoming better docs and more efficient. And, just generally happier with your lives, and then we welcome you with enthusiasm of physics talk. Um, so I, I can promise you that um, physics, while being the hot potato uh, topic for the lecturers, and everybody always sends out a list of topics and says, hey, do you want to do physics? Um, it, uh, it doesn't have to be as painful as you may have experienced in the past. So what I promise is that we will talk about physics. We won't have any graphs. I won't cover anything with names of dead scientists, and we will give you um, a really practical introduction to how to understand what the machine does and how to operate it and work the buttons on the machine to be able to get the images that you want. And that's it. I'm going to try and keep it as clinically focused as I can with it being physics. Um, but while this talk is physics and nobology, nobology being the term that ultrasound people like to throw around for the science of how to turn the knobs and operate the machine, um, I think it could also be called depth gain on. And if you know how to turn the machine on or recognize that it's already on, which, by the way, is the only prerequisite for this lecture, um, and you can adjust the gain and adjust the depth, you can do 90 plus percent of everything you need to do, and you can do every life saving application of ultrasound and every procedure in ultrasound. So you'll get, you will introduce you to all the modes and some of the functionality. But the bottom line is know where the power button is or know that the machine's on, adjust the gain, adjust the depth, and you're pretty much good to go. What we're going to try and do is take you from getting an image of the right upper quadrant that looks like this and transition you to an image that looks more like that so you can make clinical decisions and decide, yes, this person has free fluid in their abdomen. So we'll understand how ultrasound works. We'll prepare you to acquire and interpret images, and we're going to try and limit it to clinically relevant material. Now, ultrasound as a whole has, point of care ultrasound has three steps. You need to be able to acquire the images adequately, interpret the images correctly, and then apply it to a clinical scenario. We're not going to get into clinical scenario applications. That's going to happen over the course of the, of the five days. So image generation, just a little bit about how an ultrasound system works. There are several components. We've got a display screen. The entire machine itself is just a circuit that does processing, and then transducers. There's a cord with all the cables from the transducer, and then here's a make-believe object. So what ultrasound does to generate an image is an electrical pulse will come down from the circuit board, and each cord actually goes to an individual crystal. Now, a typical ultrasound uh, transducer will have between 100 and 200 crystals. Uh, I did not have the time in preparing this lecture to make 100 of them, so we'll assume that they're there. So the pulse comes down, it travels to them, they vibrate, and they're made of special material, which we'll talk about. It emits a sound. The sound bounces off mechanically the forms of crystals, which then transduce to electricity and will generate an image on the screen. So the crystals inside of the transducer are piezoelectric crystals. They have this special ability to receive an electrical signal and vibrate, which creates a mechanical pressure wave, otherwise known as sound. It goes off, it hits something, it comes back, that mechanical wave deforms the crystals which transduce that energy into electricity, and you see a signal. Thankfully, this all goes on without you having to do anything about it, but that's why it's a transducer. It takes electricity and turns it to sound. Now, 
all of those cables going to individual crystals are pretty fragile. And if you were to drop an ultrasound transducer, which none of you have ever done, you'll see that you may break one of the ultrasound, um, one, of the, one of the cords connecting the little cables connecting to the transducers. And if you do that, you'll see this. Now, I thankfully don't have any ultrasound images from actually dropped transducers that have dropout like this. Um, but if it were an April leaf transducer with only five crystals, we've lost one of them here. So they're really, really fragile. Does anyone know the most expensive part of an ultrasound system? I'm giving you a hint. Okay, it's, the, it's actually the cord, but the cord is built into the transducer. The transducer cable is the most expensive, but the transducer head itself is, is equally uh, valuable. You can't just replace the head. So don't drop the transducers. You want to think of it as something extraordinarily precious that <laughs> should not be left in the hands of people who can't be trusted. So um, don't drop the transducer. Don't drop the transducer. Okay. Enough about how the system uh, works in terms of generating sound. This is how it generates an image. The pulse that goes out will hit an object and come back. And if it hits nothing, it actually won't generate anything. It'll be black, and we'll get to that. But how deep on the screen the image is represented is just time of flight. So if the pulse comes out, hits a nearby object, and returns quickly, the machine assumes it's close to the skin surface, which is going to be up at the top of the screen. On the other hand, if you have a deep object, that time of flight is much longer, and the ultrasound system interprets that as being deep on the screen. Is that clear? It's pretty straightforward. Now, this will come into play with some of the artifacts that we see, because the ultrasound system assumes that things that take longer to come back have to be deeper. It's not always true, depending on, on what we see. Um, the other thing we need to talk about is sort of brightness. Okay? And you'll hear hyperechoic, anechoic, isoechoic, hypoechoic. You'll hear all those terms batted around. I'm okay if you decide that things are white, black, or gray, um, but we'll talk about the, the common terminology, so at least when you talk to somebody who cares, they, you can use the right terms. If you strike an object and all of the echoes return to the probe, so we'll just go back, everything comes back, nothing transmits through that object. That's a hyper-echoic object. There's lots of echoes coming back to the probe. That's going to be displayed as something bright white. Things that are bright white in the body, trying to keep it clinically focused, gallstones, will be bright white. Bone cortex will be bright white. So this is a shoulder dislocation with the scapula here and the displaced humerus. We don't see much echoes below the cortex because the ultrasound doesn't penetrate bone, but the surface itself is bright. This is a UBJ stone in the bladder, again, bright. So stones, bones, the lung, the pleural line, those are things that we see as hyperechoic structures in the body. Now, on the other hand, if the pulse goes directly through the object and nothing comes back to it, there's no returning echoes, it's anechoic, so it's black. So the lumen of the gallbladder, in this case, would be black. Anything that you see on ultrasound is black, is fluid. Fluid is the only structure in the body you're going to see where nothing comes back. It passes entirely through the structure. So we'll see that, whether it's the lumen of an anomaly or aneurysm here with a bunch of neural thrombus that, that is epigenic, but we've got the lumen here, the blood itself is black, or the globe, and here's a retinal detachment in the posterior chamber, but the vitreous itself is, is black. So urine will be black, blood will be black, bile will be black, pus may be echogenic, depending, because it's got particular matter. Okay, and then a lot of the things in ultrasound will experience a mix somewhere in between the two. So the pulse comes down, some of it goes through the object, and some of it returns to the object, so it has some echoes returning, but it's not bright white, and it's not black. It's somewhere in between. It's gray. This can be hypoechoic, isoechoic. These are relative terms. I think people get a little bit confused up front. If something's hypoechoic, it's less bright than something next to it or around it. If something's isoechoic, it's the same degree of echoes as something around it. So you can't really just be a hypoechoic in a vacuum. But you could be hyperechoic or anechoic in a vacuum. So in this case, the renal cortex itself is hypoechoic in comparison to the lining of the renal blacking system, which is hyperechoic. And this is anechoic in a patient with hyperneurosis. This is a catheter within the internal jugular vein, and the sternocleidomastoid is hypoechoic with respect to the fascia that's around it. Okay, that's enough of terminology. We'll get into practical stuff on how to work the systems. So we talked about transducers and why they're important. Um, Choosing the right transducer is like choosing the right loading to scope. And you know, if you don't pick the right tool, you're not going to get the right result. 
So if I go to intubate a two-month-old with a MAC4 laryngoscope, I'm going to have problems. And likewise, if I choose a really high-frequency probe to take a look at an obese patient's gallbladder or abdominal aortic aneurysm, I am set up to fail. It will not work no matter what. So we need to at least be able to pick the right transducer for the right application. And we'll run through the four most commonly available transducers that you'll see, and you'll have a chance to use all of these types of transducers over the next few days while we're here. So a high-frequency linear transducer. This is great for things that are close to the skin surface and that require a lot of detail. So here's a finger in a water bath. We'll cover this at some point, I'm sure. But something to just increase the visibility of near field structures. And there's an abscess in the finger that we're able to see with, um, with the high-frequency probe. This is great for anything that's within 6 to 12 centimeters of the skin surface, depending so if you're placing a, a ultrasound guided catheter into somebody, whether it's central venous or it's elsewhere, if you are looking for skin or soft tissue abnormalities, if you're looking for fractures in bones that are close to the skin surface, if you're looking at nerves, you're looking at anything sort of close to the skin, small parts imaging, you want a high frequency probe. This is another high frequency probe, and it's the intracavitary or, or endocavitary probe. Um, People don't think of this one as a high-frequency probe because it's used, obviously, for pelvic imaging most of the time, although you can use it for other things as well. Um, and, but it is, and it won't penetrate deeply into tissues. And this is a patient with an endovaginal ultrasound. Here's the uterus. Here's the empty endometrial stripe. And down here is the fetus in an ectopic pregnancy. But notice only 8 centimeters. 8 centimeters isn't very big, right? So this is still a high-frequency transducer. This is one of the pitfalls in OB imaging, is make sure you look with a low-frequency transducer first, because you'll only see a very narrow frame of view with a high-frequency transducer. You may miss the big picture of what's going on in the pelvis. Not in this case, but in other cases. Low-frequency probes are the opposite of high. They operate at a lower frequency, and they penetrate deeply into tissue. This is a thin patient. This is 13 centimeters. But these will go down to 30, 35 centimeters. If you want to look at something in the abdominal cavity, this is the best probe for you. And it will allow you, you can look at the chest with this probe, you can look at the abdomen. You'll have a hard time looking at things like superficial vessels. You couldn't really do a good peripheral IV with this probe. You might have a hard time putting in an internal jugular vein, although one of my many jobs, that's what we had when we showed up, was this probe and an intercavitary probe that worked some of the time. And we placed IV catheter, uh, internal jugular lines with this. So, you know, you can make do with what you have, but not ideal for superficial stuff. And then the other low-frequency probe that you need to become familiar with is the phased array probe or the cardiac probe. This probe has a really narrow footprint. The footprint is the part of the probe that touches the patient. So this fits in between rib spaces really well and allows you to image the heart without getting a bunch of rib shadow, as you get from the cardiac probe, I mean, from the curvilinear probe. So you'll see it starts with sort of a narrow footprint, and you're able to see the heart in this patient that's dilated in an LV thrombus. Okay. You don't need to know these numbers. Um, this is up here to remind me to tell you that these probes are broadband transducers. You'll hear that term thrown around every now and then. And what that means is it operates along a range of frequencies. So even though one's high frequency, one's low frequency, you can adjust the frequency for any given probe. That isn't something you'll need to do probably 85% of the time. But maybe 10, 15% of the time, you go to image an obese patient, and you need to actually drop the frequency on the curvilinear probe down to 2 megahertz, or drop it down to the penetration setting, depending on what, what system you're using. And that's going to allow the lower frequencies to penetrate deeper. If you have a real thin patient who you're imaging with an abdominal probe, you may want to bring it up to 5, because you'll get higher resolution, the picture will look nicer, and you don't need that extra depth. So they are all broadband, and you can adjust the frequency of any given probe. And we'll show you how to do this during all the hands-on sessions so you know how to do it on the machines. Okay, getting oriented to the system. The first time you use a machine that you haven't used before or a transducer that you haven't used before on a machine that you have used, you want to be able to determine which side is which. And this is just like figuring out your bearings when you're getting on to scanning the patient. Every machine will have some sort of indicator over here. It'll be either an initial of the company that makes the machine, or it'll be a certain colored dot, or it'll be a letter. Um, and it's going to be typically to the screen left in all of the abdominal and small parts imaging, and to the screen right if you're doing traditional cardiac imaging. So echo is the one exception. We'll get into that, I'm sure, with the echo talks. But for the most part, it's on the left. So take a little bit of gel, put it on one side of the probe. And if this side lights up, that's the left side. 
If this side lights up, well, then that must be the left side. They'll also have some sort of little nubbin or groove or a colored line or something to indicate it. But I think that the probes can be confusing because some of them have little biopsy attachments. And you'll actually see mechanical stuff on both sides of the probe. And just looking at it, it's kind of hard to figure out which side is the directional indicator side. So put a little gel on or just put gel on the whole probe and tap on one side of it and just get your bearings right. That side, that indicator side on the probe, is conventionally going to go towards the patient's head or towards the patient's right. And we'll scan with you guys, we'll go through this, but towards the head, towards the right for abdominal and traditional um, radiology imaging for cardiology, it's different. Okay, why is it important? This is an image many of you are probably used to seeing or have seen in text or have obtained yourselves during your practice. This is somebody with ascites, and here's the liver, here's the kidney here, and this anechoic stripe in here is the free fluid in their abdomen. You've seen a little bit of diaphragm. Now, when I see that image, that's pattern recognition, that looks like a positive fast exam, somebody with peritoneal fluid. When I see that image, it looks like a positive fast exam in somebody with peritoneal fluid, but it makes me cringe, and it feels like, it's like watching somebody drive on the wrong side of the road. Right? It, it, it should induce this sort of feeling of unease, like something's just not right. And it, could you get a diagnosis? Yeah, but we, we've seen people get really confused from looking the wrong way, and waste a lot of time trying to get an image they're familiar with. So just keep it towards the head, keep it towards the patient's right. Obviously those aren't fixed, you can scan in between those dimensions if there's a little bit of give there, but don't put it towards the patient's feet or towards the patient's left or you're going to end up getting reverse images and you'll be confusing yourself and everyone around you. Alright, scanning technique. There's really three predominant ways that you can scan because there's three axes to the body. So this is an axial or transverse view of the abdomen. Here we've got the indicator under my thumb there. It's towards the patient's right. This is a really challenging, obese patient. You can see that we're working on. And we're looking at the abdominal aorta, which is kind of pulsating the probe because he's so skinny, but this is a teaching scan, obviously. So we're putting steady pressure on. I'd like to call attention to the blanching of my thumb and index finger. You want to grab the probe down in these little grooves close to the skin, to the skin surface and to the footprint. I see everybody pick the probe the first time and hold it back here. So they're holding it up like this, which makes it really hard to get fine control of the probe. You want to grab it all the way down, sort of like you're grabbing a pen or a scalpel, and you want to be able to use the rest of your hand to brace on the patient if you need to, to stop yourself from sliding around. And good technique in terms of just holding the transducer is key, and it's something we need to focus on day one. Now here we're turning to a longitudinal view. The indicator is going to be up towards the head. You'll notice there's a lot of different moves you can do. Rock the probe up and down, fan it left and right. These are all things that are far better taught at the bedside, but we're just introducing these concepts, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. But this is a long view or a sagittal view. If you were off over here, but in the same orientation, it would be a parasagittal view. I prefer just using long and short. I think it's easy. We either slice the body short ways or we slice it long ways. And then this is a coronal view, so you're slicing out across the body. Again, I would call this a long view just because. It's again still long on the body just to keep things simple. We have enough to remember that's clinically relevant. We don't need to use radiology terminology just because we think it's proper. Um, and here we're between the ribs. This is just to let you know it is fluid, right? You don't need to be straight up and down on the patient. You can actually go in line with the ribs and get between the rib shadow. So it's between the head and between the patient's right, but it's, it's totally acceptable to play around with that and oblique the probe or twist the probe as we're shown here. Okay. On to nebology or system controls. Now, everybody who uses an ultrasound machine for the first time uh, or approaches an ultrasound machine, I think, experiences some version of button shock. So they walk up to the machine and they get incredibly intimidated and say there's a million different buttons and they don't know what to press and so they're automatically a little bit averse to using it. I had the same reaction when I got my new remote for my television. Um, and I, you know, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I've got two young boys, and you know, when you really need a break, it's nice to put something on for them. And they, uh, I don't know how to use still probably 70% of the buttons on my remote, but I'm able to watch TV effectively. And I think that's the way you should look at your ultrasound system, is you're going to be able to operate it. Just because I don't know how to do picture in picture and like record the game at the same time that my kid's watching Blue's Clues, doesn't mean I can't watch television. So I'd like you to think of something that's familiar and simple, and we're going to create our own remote for the ultrasound system, and we'll talk about how to use it, and we'll add a couple of buttons, but understand that if it just looked like this, it would work fine. 
Now we're all familiar with on def game. So I told you that's all you needed to know. That is all you need to know. We'll talk about a couple of extra features, but truly that's all you need to know. So on we said was the one prerequisite for the course. So I can't teach you where the button is on your machine. I know you guys can do that. Um, this is uh, this is game. Okay, so game is the overall brightness on the screen. And you're not frying the patient with more power of ultrasound waves when you turn the gain up. It's all post-processing stuff. So you're never going to have anybody catch on fire when you turn the gain all the way up. But obviously, too little gain and too much gain can be a problem. So this is a pretty decently gained image, maybe a little bit dark. And then as you turn the gain up, you start seeing echoes appearing in the vessel here, which are obviously false. It's too bright. And then as you turn it down, it's kind of intuitive that if it's completely black, you can't see anything. It's too little gain. That's going to vary depending on your clinical setting. If you're in a dark radiology room, you may have very little gain and be able to see things beautifully. If you're in a brightly lit fluorescent trauma bay with you know, bright, bright lights and people running around, you're not going to stop your trauma resuscitation to turn the lights off. So it's going to be a higher gain. There is no right answer. It's the right answer is when you can see the images, you can see the structures on there and distinguish them from each other, and you don't see false artifacts appearing in things that shouldn't be there. So that's sort of a judgment call. Some of the machines will have the ability to adjust gain based on depth. And this is something called time gain compensation, or TGC. These are the TGC knobs that you'll see. They look like an equalizer on your stereo. This is, I think, one of the single things that intimidates people the most when they approach an ultrasound machine, is they say, I have no idea what to do with those. I should probably not touch them. And it's probably fun if you don't touch them. They're, um, the machines these days actually compensate for the distance that the wave travels through body and comes back, and the fact that it's a weaker signal from deep tissues. And it, it, you'll, you'll do fine if you never adjust these. But if you have them, you know, here's a really full bladder. We're seeing a lot of bright stuff underneath the bladder and having a hard time making out structures deep to it. And if we could just decrease the gain over here, but not for the whole image, that would probably clean it up. So that's exactly what we're going to do. And now you can see deep to the bladder a little bit better than you would see otherwise. If you decrease the overall gain, that would work fine too. So again, a nice feature, but not essential. Depth is essential. And here's a peripheral vein we're going to kind of leave. It's just a few millimeters under the skin, so you can't really feel it. You don't see it, but you know that it's pretty superficial and you want to be able to stick a needle into it. And there's no reason to not just fill the screen with the object that's interesting to you. So as you decrease the depth here, it gets bigger, there's less distraction, and you're filling the screen with what you want to see. So depth is important, and depth is probably the single most important, even above gain, because all of the systems these days have some button you can press that'll guess at what the right gain is. So you could just get away with doing that and know how to adjust depth. Why is it important clinically? Well, you know, here's a heart. We're in a short axis. There's some pericardial fluid here. When it first started off, you couldn't really see the pericardial fluid. We're getting a sense that there's some fluid deep to the heart here. And again, if you don't look deep enough, you're not going to see it if you're too superficial. And this provider then goes ahead and increases the depth more, and now there's a pleural effusion down here. So in general, start off really deep with your depth, and then take it up. And that way you're sure that you're seeing everything that's important on the screen and you're not missing things deep to uh, the object of interest. Here's sort of the opposite. This would be a good way to start an exam. So this is an end of actual exam. We're going to see the uterus here in a, in a long set, uh, axis. And as we fan through in the adnexa, there's this giant uh, cystic structure with internal echoes and septations. This is a big complex cyst. But we have 13 centimeters of depth. Arguably, the most important structure that we see deepest on the screen is probably five or six centimeters. So all of this is wasted space. And you'd see things with a lot greater detail if you were able to bring that up. So you want to go ahead and start deep and then decrease your depth to maximize the size of the objects that you're looking at on the screen. OK, we could stop here, and you would know how to work an ultrasound system. We'll go on, obviously, because there's a few other things that we want to cover. So modes. What we've been looking at so far is something called B mode, or brightness mode, or 2D echo, or grayscale. Those terms, for our purposes, can be used interchangeably. It's what you think of when you think of ultrasound. It's a two-dimensional image with a scale of black, white, and gray. And here we're seeing a patient with a pleural effusion on the right side, the liver here, diaphragm, and that gives us a ton of information. This is M mode, or motion mode. And what this does is it takes your B mode image on top, drops a line down that people will call a spike or an ice pick or a sample line, and then it displays that over time. So you're looking at just these echoes over time and looking at motion. And this is the vena cava. You shouldn't measure in that mode because as you breathe in, you're measuring the diaphragm, not the vena cava. 
but that's for another day of the conference. But this is great for cardiac imaging. It's great for measuring fetal heart rates. So we do use it for those things, and I think it's worthwhile. Color flow is essentially Doppler displayed as colors. We're all familiar with the Doppler phenomenon. Any ambulance that's either approached you or gone away from you with its sirens, you've heard the Doppler phenomenon, and the frequency will shift as it's moving away or towards you. And this is all that the ultrasound system does, is it listens for frequencies that have shifted a little bit, and it assumes those frequencies have shifted due to motion of structures it's encountering, for the most part, blood in this case. So this is an image of the heart, and on the right ventricle and right atrium, we see this giant jet of flow away from the probe. This blue is down, way towards the bottom, red is towards the probe. And this is tricuspid regurgitation in a patient with core pulmonale. But this is a useful thing for cardiac imaging. Could you make critical diagnoses in cardiac imaging without ever turning on color flow? Absolutely. You would be able to diagnose tamponade, you'd be able to diagnose RV strain, LP failure. You don't need color for any of those things. But for advanced imaging, it's nice to put color on things and to know what you're looking at. Again, not a necessity, but something worthwhile. This is directional color power Doppler, or directional color flow. On the other hand, you have color power Doppler. And that's just, is there flow or is there not flow? So this is a lymph node in the patient who was undergoing an exam for DVT and found to just have a bad cyclitis with large cells of adenopathy. And there's a bunch of flow inside the hyaline of this node. Now, when you want to detect really, really slow flow, like flow in a testicular torsion, or flow in a testicle, flow in an ovary that you're concerned about torsion, flow in a, in a lymph node, color power is a lot more sensitive for low flow because the machine's not wasting its time trying to determine whether it's coming towards the probe or away from the probe. It's just looking for any motion. So obviously, this wouldn't help you if we were looking at the heart, and it was just maroon color, and we didn't know which direction it was going. It'd be a little bit strange to look at it with color power. So for cardiac structures, you're going to use directional flow. For small structures close to the skin, you'll use color power. And again, not essential. You could use directional flow here, and you'd still see flow. It just wouldn't look quite as good. So these are little things that can improve your scanning, but not critical. This is pulse wave Doppler. And in fact, this is actually triplex or spectral Doppler. This is a color image here. So there's B mode in the background. You're getting color through this box on this superficial artery. You're then putting a pulse wave gate in the vessel and it's showing you graphically what the color shows you in terms of color. So you're seeing the velocity of the waves, you're seeing that it's periodic and high amplitude, so this is an artery and not a vein. There's applications for pulse wave Doppler, we'll talk about them. That's probably going to be not until we get into advanced cardiac imaging. There's continuous wave, and again, this is just to introduce you to the breadth of modes. It doesn't mean you need to ever do continuous wave Doppler. Continuous wave Doppler just gives you a higher Frequency, so you can, excuse me, you can detect higher velocities with continuous wave than you can with pulse wave. So this is somebody with tricuspid regurgitation, and by looking at their peak tricuspid regurgitation velocity, you're able to calculate that plus their CVP will give you their pulmonary artery pressures. So there are utilities if you're using this in critical care or in advanced emergency medicine critical care, but continuous wave Doppler is just the ability to detect higher velocity flow than you'd get off pulse wave. Okay, so there's B mode. That's your, that's your home base. That's the only thing you ever really need to use. M mode or motion mode over time, particularly for fetal imaging or for looking at cardiac images. And then there's all the Doppler stuff, whether it's color, directional color, color power, pulse wave Doppler, continuous wave, all Doppler. Okay, focus. Some of the systems that you'll use don't have the ability to adjust focus. Most of them do. And what focus is, is it is the area from top to bottom on the screen where the ultrasound beam is the narrowest and you get the highest resolution. So on this image, this is where the focus is set right now. And there'll be a, a control that you can just decrease the focus. So this is going to be spleen and kidney, and this is a patient with trauma. We're concerned about a small hemothorax in this patient who looked like they had a pneumothorax. And looking at it, pay attention down here. And so much more easy to visualize this black collection. Right here it's kind of gray, you don't see it distinctly. And as you bring the focus down, you see it distinctly. If there isn't a particular area on the screen that you're interested in looking at, and you just want the whole picture, let's say you're looking at Morrison's pouch and trauma in the right upper quadrant, put the focus all the way at the bottom of the screen. So if there's not one area that's of interest, put it all the way at the bottom. If there's an area, put it at that level that you're interested in. Okay, additional controls we won't cover. Tissue harmonic imaging 
it basically cleans up fluid filled structures. You'll see what that does in cardiac imaging and some abdominal imaging. Spatial compounding is um, something that's called different on every single ultrasound system because they have their own proprietary way of doing it. But it's basically the ultrasound uh, transducer sends out beams in multiple planes and it averages them and it kind of cleans up some soft tissue stuff. And then we want to talk about how to annotate and put text and calipers and do measurements and do zoom because that's going to be different system to system. We also want to talk about how to freeze images, store them, or print them, but those are things that you'll commonly do with the knobs and buttons on the machine. We'll cover quickly artifacts and then we'll be done with the physics medicine that we had to take before taking this course. Okay, we're used to artifacts, right? I mean, this is somebody with a bullet lodged in the base of the brain. It's clearly causing a ton of artifact on CT. And we know that the artifacts are essentially things that appear on images that are false representations of anatomy. This person does not have strange black lines streaking through their face. We know that just by looking at it. And in ultrasound, for some reason, it tends to confuse us a little bit sometimes. So some of them are useful. These are gallstones. There's shadows coming off of them because the ultrasound beam comes down and hits the gallstone and reflects, and not much of it can transmit through that dense stone. So we see these shadows. Seeing those shadows helps us confirm that it's gallstones. So it is an artifact. There's no shadow running through the gallbladder. But um, this gives us some meaningful information. <coughs> we'll also see shadowing in pulmonary imaging. So here we've got rib cortex, which is bright, and then shadowing dark and deep to it. And this bright blur line moving back and forth with some pulmonary congestion, this tells us we have a good vision of the lung. We're seeing rib, rib, the lung, the blur line right here, and it gives us sort of a home base. So shadowing can be useful for us. Reverberation gets back to the time equals distance problem with ultrasound. So what happens here is the beam comes down, hits the lung, which in this case is full of air, it's a normal lung, bounces back to the probe, bounces back to the lung line, to the fur line, bounces back, bounces back, bounces back, bounces back. Every one of those returning signals in succession, the machine assumes must be deeper on the screen because it took longer for it to return. So you'll see the first one come back here, the second returning signal gets displayed here, the third here, the fourth here. They fade in terms of their strength because they're bouncing back and forth and attenuating. And the distance between the skin and the line is the same distance between these lines. That's reverberation artifact. We'll see that in the lung. We'll see it in a number of different places. Edge artifact, worth mentioning. Um, if you've ever put a piece of silverware into a glass of water and it looks bent, or you've sat at the edge of a pool and looked at your legs in the pool that look like there's an angle where there isn't an angle, that's what happens when the sound beam encounters a fluid tissue interface. And we'll see this commonly in the gallbladder. So as the beam comes down, it kind of refracts around the edge of the gallbladder and you're left with this shadow where no, no returning signals come back. This can fake people out for gallstones because they see a shadow and it's the gallbladder and they worry that it may be a gallstone. And I'm sure the gallstone, gallbladder talk, the later talk will cover that in more detail. Acoustic enhancement. This is a, one of the images I like for talking about artifacts because it's got a few things going on. You've got gallstones here, and this is what, what, what's here? Shadowing, right? We know that shadowing. Why is the liver tissue here darker than the liver tissue here? It's the same liver. There's no actual anatomic abnormality, right? Yeah, so I see people gesticulating uh, acoustic enhancement, which is fun to watch. So it basically, the, the beam comes down, and it gets sort of a free pass through the fluid, right? It travels easily through it. It doesn't attenuate or get weakened as it travels through fluid. So the intensity of the returning signal here, deep to this fluid filled structure, which is the gallbladder, is brighter than it is next door, where it had to go and work its way to the liver to get down there. Okay, so seeing acoustic enhancement, posterior acoustic enhancement, brightness deep to a structure, actually confirms that that structure is fluid filled. It's a no brainer here with the gallbladder, but you'll see cysts sometimes that, are, that have echogenic material in them, and being able to tell that it's brighter deep to that cyst lets you know that's actually a fluid filled structure and not a solid mass. So again, subtle stuff, but worth it, talking about who's going to encounter it. Ring down artifacts, you'll see off of either um, small reverberations in the lung, or you'll see it off of metallic objects. These, uh, this patient with pulmonary edema obviously doesn't have little needle-like things that are transmitting into their chest. Um, but you will see this sort of ring down artifact in specific scenarios. And then mirror image, um, you just kind of have to mention, because it's commonly mentioned when you talk about artifact, and it's useful when you look at the lung and when you look for pulmonary, uh, for pleural effusions or for hemothorax. So here's a liver. This is a hemangioma, and here's a hemangioma. This one's not real. This one's real. This one's displayed above the diaphragm. Also, this kind of looks like liver tissue out here. And we know that the liver is on the downside of the diaphragm, not in the chest. 
So what's happening here is the beam comes down, it hits the diaphragm and reflects, hits the structure and bounces back. But the other assumption that ultrasound systems make, aside from time equals distance, is that ultrasound beams travel in a straight line. So it th even though the path of the beam actually went like this, the machine assumes the path of the beam went like that. So it will represent the stuff on the other side of the diaphragm. And this is useful in the sense that if you see liver tissue on the other side of the diaphragm, there's no fluid there. Because if there's fluid in the pleural cavity, it won't reflect. It'll transmit right through it. So this is a good way to exclude uh, pleural effusions by seeing mirror beam. OK, so in summary, and we are on to the really fun stuff of the conference, um, this is all you need to know about operating ultrasound system. Pick the right transducer for the right application. Scan with good technique, hold the transducer down towards the footprint, towards the part that interacts with the patient, grip it strongly, use the free portion of your hand to brace against the patient so you're not slipping and sliding all over the place, and know which side your directional indicator is on. You're going to need to adjust gain and depth on almost everybody in some way. The other things that you need to adjust, like focus and time gain compensation, maybe as you get more comfortable, you'll start, you'll start to play around with those, but they're not necessities. And recognize some of the common artifacts so you don't you know, call your consultants and say there's a big mass above the diaphragm and below the diaphragm, this person's really sick. Uh, so I think it's worth um, knowing what the common ones are, and I'll take questions if we have them while we're, while we're transitioning on this, but thanks, guys. Yeah? Can I have a reflection of the angioma? Yes. Is the reflection always distal or distant from the probe? It's never proximal, so you don't get a reflection proximal to the probe? You mean up here? Yeah, the probe's on the skin. So probe's the reflection on the skin. is always farther away from the probe. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah, because if it's not traveling in a straight line, it's going to um, have an additional path in order to get back from wherever it got back from. So it has to, that extra time is going to display, be displayed deeper on the screen. All right. You good? Thanks, Mike. Okay, I guess we'll just do what we can. Weird. Why would it do that? Okay. Better? Okay. And then. Okay. 
to see desktop because it would go to desktop, right? That's what we did last time. That was key. Just click on the clipper and introduce it. Give me a second. All right, everybody, sorry about the delay there. Uh, always interesting whenever you're trying to stream something live over the entire world, things may, makes things a little bit more complicated. Uh, I'm honored today to introduce uh, Dr. Cliff Reed. Uh, Cliff is, uh, I guess I can call him a friend now. Uh, we, we met at Castle Fest last year, which was a, a great time. Uh, Cliff is a retrieval doc. Cliff is a retrieval doc uh, and a senior staff specialist and supervisor of training in the greater Sydney area. So he's, he's from down under. Uh, he uh, practices on a helicopter, uh, I think majority of his time, spends a little bit of time in the emergency department. So he's, he's very aware of trauma medicine. and uh, he's, a, he's a great ultrasonographer. Uh, and he's uh, also the curator of Recess Me, which is a, a pretty awesome, uh, uh, not really a podcast, more like a blog, where uh, Cliff sort of scans through all the all the research and, and publishes on a fairly regular basis his interpretation of the research on lots of issues, mostly really related to resuscitation in medicine, uh, and medicine, and it's very interesting. Uh, he's also infamous not only for his, his blog and Recess Me, uh, but he's also infamous for uh, being on the Farm podcast, which you haven't checked out. is, is pretty amazing. Uh, they do pre-hospital and retrieval medicine, and he's a regular contributor to Ian Crit. so uh, my guess is you've probably heard of him before. Uh, but he's also actually infamous not just for that, but also for his presentations at Castle Fest last year, where he wowed the crowd uh, and scared them all at the same time. And it's not just the crowd that he impressed. Cliff really he hit home with Matt and I. Uh, you know, I feel like our relationship really grew over Castle Fest last year, and it was it was something that really I can't put into anything. I can't put it into words. The way I feel about Cliff Reed. So without further ado, Dr. Reed, if you'll come up. So I, um, I work for the ambulance service in New South Wales, which is a big area. It's about the size of Texas, and we go and pick up trauma patients, and we have to treat them in the field because it's a long way to the trauma centres. And I'll start with a case, and then we'll see how we apply trauma ultrasound to this patient, and then we'll discuss how to do trauma ultrasound, and we'll look at a heap of other cases as well. So this is my office, one of them, and uh, we took it to a place in southwest New South Wales where a motorcyclist had come off at speed, not collided with anything, just going out of band, came off. He had severe lower back pain, he was hypertensive. And the local paramedics had driven out to him and had done a really good job. They provided oxygen, a sea collar, vascular access, they'd given him some fluid because he'd been hypotensive and tachycardic. He was in a lot of pain, they'd given him up to 20 milligrams of morphine, and they applied um, a splint of his pelvis in the form of a, of a tight fitting sheet. Um, so it was pretty much it. They'd uh, used up all the things they could do for him. They needed to get to hospital. He remained hypotensive and it would have driven them all, it would have taken them all day to drive to hospital. It was more than an hour's flight for us. And we had a look at him. And before I show you the next slide, I just want to warn you folks who perhaps enjoy the luxury of limiting your practice to 
hostile environment that don't have to face the hideous and sometimes appalling scenes that we must endure in the field, like this. <laughs> this is called the Biker's Bar, and so this is his mate helping us uh, package him. And we have a look at him outside the ambulance, and you're not listening, are you? You're just looking at that bar crap there. So let's, let's go on to the next uh, picture. So we get him in the helicopter after we've had a look, and he, um, he remains hypotensive. And we've got a long flight, and I don't want him to die in the helicopter, but I don't want to do any unnecessary procedures in the helicopter. Um, so what do we do? We do ultrasound. We do a trauma ultrasound and we take a look at him. Clearly he had no long bone fractures, so there's blood on the floor or three more. We can have a look at those three spaces. Um, and uh, he, he didn't have any blood in his pericardium, he didn't have any pleural blood, any hemothoraces, and he had a negative fast scan, and importantly a negative serial fast scan, so he didn't seem to have any significant evidence of Hemorrhage outside his retroperitoneal or his pelvis. And low back pain and a motorcyclist to me, to most of us who do M's work, means pelvic fracture to improve my lungs. And so we could fairly confidently hand him over to the trauma team saying, This guy has uh, got a significant pelvic injury, we think. Um, and in fact, he did, and uh, that was managed angiographically. He did well. So we did a focused assessment by sonography and trauma. Uh, the fast scan, and that looks for fluid in the peritoneum and pericardium. And if you do an extended fast scan, EFAST, that's the first looking for pleural fluid. In the context of trauma, that's going to be hemothorax and pleural gas or pneumothorax. Coming back to the fast scan, when you look at the abdomen, what does a positive result mean? Well, in the context of trauma, again, uh, it means the patient's leading to the abdomen. It doesn't show you blood, it shows you free fluid. And as we'll keep coming back to today, um, the interpretation of ultrasound, like any other diagnostic test, depends on the pre-test assessment. So it depends on the clinical context. What does a negative fast scan mean? Does it mean there's no bleeding? Well, not really, because it's not 100% sensitive. But serial fast scans are much more reliable way of warning out significant injury abdominal bleeding. So in an extended fast, we're looking for gas in one space, around the lungs, and fluid in three spaces, around the lungs, around the heart, and in the abdomen. It is less sensitive than CT, but bear in mind, when you look at studies that compare C ultrasound with CT as the gold standard for looking at blood, a lot of those are done in stable patients. If you take those studies that look at subgroups of sick patients, the hemodynamically unstable, shocked patient that we need an instant decision on, then fast is very sensitive. Um, and of course, we don't have a CT scan in the field, and it might not be appropriate to take a patient to your CT scanner if they're unstable and living in the resuscitating. But it definitely has a role in trauma. As Mike said, we use an appropriate transducer, we use a curvilinear transducer with the probe mark corresponding to the mark on the screen, and we'll practice all that in the practical sessions. Okay. Now, is anyone here a complete novice at ultrasound? Is anyone here doing ultrasound for the first time? Maybe some of the people watching online are. And it can get confusing when you pick up an ultrasound for the first time and you see just shades of grey with some black and some white. And like when you're introduced to anything for the first time, it can be a bit bewildering. And you need to get some familiarity before you're comfortable with it. So, in essence, fast scanning is about looking for the black, pointy stuff. So free fluid, fluid is dark, but free fluid collects around other structures and goes into recesses and spaces and virtual spaces. And so it's pointy. Whereas pale or white and roundy stuff tends to be organs. So I'm looking for black, pointy stuff when I'm doing a fast scan. So this is black, so it's fluid, but it's not pointy, so it's contained within the structure. So that could be called bladder, for example. It's not free fluid. And this is black, but it's not fluid. It extends all the way to the top of the image, so it's probably an artifact, it's probably a piece of shadow of a rib, for example. So beware, black doesn't necessarily mean free fluid. It might be fluid or it might be artifact. So it's a black and pointy. 
that's a little floating around, there's black and pointy stuff. So that's three fluid. Let's look at how to do it. We'll start with the right of the quadrant view, which we're going to look for peritoneal fluid. And we're going to place the probe in the mid axillary line initially in a longitudinal fashion so the probe marker is facing towards the patient's head. This guy's going to show you exactly where to put the probe. His thumb represents the marker. Bang, right there. So that's, uh, that's a good example of how you sonographically try to find Morrison's pouch, which is this theoretical space between the kidney and the liver. So we'll put this in the liver and Mike's lecture. The kidney tends to have this bright center, the dark outline, and this area between the two is Morrison's pouch. And the reason we look for that is because in a supine patient, that's where free fluid tends to collect. So it's kind of your money shot. It's a good first place to look. Because if it's positive, in terms of peritoneal fluid, if you're done, you can move on the peritoneal. That's another example of a normal right upper quadrant view. Liver, kidney, no free fluid there. Free fluid in there. And then it's obviously moving with respiration. Is this patient bleeding into their abdomen? Who thinks yes? Okay. It's a trauma lecture, so that's reasonable. Um, there is free fluid, flat and pointy, but this is actually a um, crystalloid solution that I infused into the peritoneum of the patient in a hyperkalemic cardiac arrest to do acute peritoneal dialysis on a retrieval machine. And then took the image to be useful for this lecture. But uh, it's not. Trauma, so it's not blood, it's free fluid, but it's indistinguishable from blood on the ultrasound. But you can say it's free fluid. Okay, and we like Morris's pouch because it's on the right, and where we sit in ambulances and in helicopters, and usually on the patient's right. So we look there first, and if it's positive, like this patient's response, we like, again, we're done in terms of assessing the peritoneum for free fluid, especially for positive glass, yeah, which we detected in flight. Useful information to hand over to the trauma team. We're not going to do a lap in the helicopter. Okay, we're now going to move over from the right upper quadrant to the left upper quadrant and look around the spleen. This one's a bit harder to get because we're going to go further around and further up from there with the right upper quadrant. So it's further posterior and further superior. Okay, this guy's going to show you bang right there. And hopefully the other guy's going to, he's going to go, yep, here, right there, that's it. <laughs> so that's where you put your probe. So it's further around the back and further around. And in order to do that, if you're reaching over from the other side of the patient, it's usually examined from the patient's right. You kind of have to have your knuckles into the bed with the probe coming back up towards you through the patient. So knuckles into bed. Think about that if you're practicing that for the first time today. And it looks a bit like... The right quadrant view, doesn't it? The spleen is a bit like the other kidneys, just like kidneys. So you're looking for free fluid between the two, but you're also looking for fluid above the spleen. So if you're looking around the spleen, because it's a fairly superior structure, ribs do tend to get in the way. And you may have to look between ribs. You invariably do. It's the same with the right. If it, you can't see it in the mid axillary line, you move up between ribs. But of course, as you can see here, you get rib shadows. So you then have to angle the transducer. So it will fit between the ribs. There is an example of a positive left of the quadrant view for free fluid. You can see how some fluid is left around the bar the spleen. It doesn't necessarily go between the spleen and the kidney, but the bar the spleen too. It's a diaphragm there. We're going to move to the suprapubic view. I'm not going to show you anyone getting punched down there. It's too, too distressing to look at. Now, we're going to look around the bladder, the pelvic structures, and we're going to do it in two angles, two orientations with the probe transverse, and then flipping it around so the marker faces towards the patient's head in a longitudinal view. And in transverse view, the bladder tends to look fairly square. It's got urine in it. And in the longitudinal view, it tends to look a bit more trapezoid. Free fluid can collect around it, usually below it. It's a normal female transverse pelvic view, nice and square, usually just down here. 
the waste flow is going to collect in the female pelvis, where are you going to see those, the most dependent part of the person? In So patch of Douglas. Rectal <coughs> uterine patch. Okay. Uh, so this is a longitudinal view. There's the uterus there. What's that structure there? Pardon? Uh, yeah, and this line? Vaginal stripe. I don't know why, but I just love that term. <laughs> just imagine my dad saying, son, it's time you earned your vaginal stripes. <laughs> <laughs> So here's a um, here's a transverse view. Um, black here isn't very black; it's kind of grey in this particular view. But you've got the bladder there, you've got the uterus there, and you've got the little bit behind the uterus. In this case, it's blood. Uh, here's where it can get confusing on a single view. This patient had free fluid in her pelvis, but what are you looking at? This square structure here, transverse view, is probably the bladder. This could be uterus bent around the top. You could do it around. You would never interpret a single image uh, on its own. You're looking around. It's a moving image when you're doing the ultrasound, and you're looking at other angles too, other views, and you've got the clinical context. A small word of caution um, it's described that children and ladies who are pregnant can have some normal physiological free fluid in the pelvis. So it can give you a false positive class now. But again, it comes back to what's the quantity of free fluid and what's the clinical context. So you're not going to, an unstable trauma patient, you're not going to ignore significant free fluid in the pelvis and put that down to normal physiology. Okay, let's have a little look at the pericardium. So here we're going to put the probe under the zipper sternum. If you start slightly from the right hand side of the zipper sternum, that gives you an opportunity to look through the liver, which is an acoustic window to get a better view. So be less obscured by, by gas. And you really need to hold the probe with your hand above it so that you can push down on the probe. Because the angle you need to get is fairly shallow. I like to think, imagining I'm, I've got a spoon and I'm going to murder someone by eating their heart while they're still alive. And I'm going to Drill that spoon under their stern and scoop out their heart and punch away. Uh, so that's what a normal uh, subcostal heart looks like. You've got the liver on top. The right side of the heart is close to the liver. The liver's on the right, so that must be the right ventricle, left ventricle, right ventricle. Right ventricle. You do a lot more cardiac this afternoon. This is what we're looking for, free fluid around the heart. The patient has pericardial tendon, and there's even some echogenic thrombus floating around. And here's a patient, uh, again, liver, heart, free fluid around the heart. This patient actually had pericardial synthesis and did work with sulfur tamponade. And doing ultrasound, and then to do that stuff, it's great. We've had a number of saves with pericardial synthesis, even in our retreat service. So we looked at that one, looked at that one. This was a patient who had their pericardial fluid aspirated um, and made a reasonable short-term recovery, which is one of those moments you get with ultrasound that does make you feel pretty good. 
Okay, we're going to go on to the chess now. And actually, you do this in real, term, real time as you look at the upper quadrant views, because that's how you orientate yourself. I might have to switch to my laptop because uh, some of these animations have disappeared. But we'll see how we go. Um, so remember, uh, right quadrant, left quadrant, we had liver or spleen, and then we had diaphragm, this bright arcuate structure. It's a diaphragm. So you look above it, and uh, when there's no parapleural fluid, it's just far from air. But look, this is black and pointy. This is what a pleural effusion looks like. Um, here we have spleen, we have this bright arcuate structure, which is diaphragm, it's moving with respiration, there's black and pointy stuff, so there's fluid within the fluid space, and there's an area collapsed. Another example of a fluid fusion. So we're extending our fast just above the diaphragm. To look now onto gas. We're going to look at pneumothorax. Uh, and in a supine patient, the air is going to accumulate in the least dependent part of the patient, isn't it? Um, so we'll start with you up here. And if you hold the probe in a longitudinal <coughs> section, and you might use a linear probe for this, or you can use it if you want, but we use our service, which is the linear high frequency probe. And we try and capture two ribs within the field, because that's what helps us find a plural line, which is what we're interested in. There's a number of horizontal lines you can get from the tissues. Uh, we want to identify the plural line. And it has a specific relationship to the ribs which are cast in the acoustic shadows. And Lichtenstein, an ultrasound legend, um, talks about bats using ultrasound, using sonar to get around, and superimposing a bat here, and the bat's wings are represented by the ribs, and then you can follow the shape of the bat, the top of the body there, is where you find the plural line. And what we want to look for is lung sliding, which represents Arise and visceral pleural, pleural rubbing against each other, which excludes the thorax, and then this artifact of V line, which extends all the way down. I'll show some examples. And if those are absent, that suggests a new thorax. So we've got normal on the left side of the screen, we've got normal pleural sliding, we've got these V lines and corner tail artifacts. At the top of these artifacts on the V line, we've got these little kind of bottles hanging on. So like poles on the screen or little ants crawling along the line. It's a good thing to identify. In the new for example, there's no cool sliding, no V lines, and no little ants. Once again, we have normal on the left, normal cool sliding, little V lines, and on the right, this is new thorax, nothing. So that's your BMO 2D ultrasound way of ruling out a new thorax. And here's another example. Normal on the left, B lines, plural sliding. Then if you select MO, we're looking for, for some other features. In the normal one, there's a clear demarcation between a linear appearance and then this granular appearance. So this is normal. That's known as the seashore sign. We've got sand beach and the sea. Whereas here, it's pretty much the same linear followed by linear above and below the plural line. And that's the barcode sign, or sometimes called the stratosphere sign. A highly specific sign for the new thorax is something called the lung point, where you manage to capture the point where the new thorax starts. And so on one part of the image, you've got normal plural sliding with the B lines. And then it meets a point where those features are locked. There's a new thorax here, then a new thorax here. You see that, you definitely identify a new thorax. Okay, here's a, a young man who was uh, partaking in local sport, where I live, which is driving your car into a tree or a telegraph pole, very drunk on a Friday night. And lots of people do that. And he's trapped by compression that's blown in, so it's taken a while to get him out. He's breathless, a little bit hypoxic, hypertensive. And we can ultrasound him while he's still in the vehicle, while we're trying to clean his legs. And his left lung, so it's got some seatbelt bridge in there. Left lung is barcoded, right lung, seashore. In fact, you can see it in the time there. 
no film design or B lines. So we can identify a new thorax on the left of the young patient and deal with it there and then or shortly after extrication. And then on route, we'll do um, fast scans. We don't tend to do fast scans on the scene. We can't do anything about the answer. But these are both the fast and the ambulance. I've taken off the audio. There is a paramedic sitting next to me calling me a knucklehead, which sounded quite good, but I haven't removed it. Uh, and that's the same patient, and uh, that's um, the street for the remarks. That's the pelvic view, and the transverse, which is the screen reading, obviously, in the longitudinal display here. This is free fluid, it's lap and pointy, it's about. Here's another positive monitor snatch view, weakly positive, but it's positive, it's free fluid there. This was a child, uh, fixed with blood torn in the child, initial fast scan done, and fixed in the aircraft, looked at the cable, it was repeated subsequently during the same flight, it has become positive, showing the value of serial fast scans. This is a right quadrant view, positive and negative fast scan. Negative, look, getting there, little there, that's fluid, but it's within the vessel within the Left of quadrant, positive or negative? Yeah, so it's fluid, you can see between the background and the screen. Um, so it's possible to be fluid. This is a patient with congestive heart failure and ascites. This is get the same view of trauma and the bleeding. And a clearly positive right quadrant with a liver. Okay, this is an old lady who fell over, had a little bit of a sore chest, completely normal vital signs. The resident sends her off for a chest x ray and uh, says, uh, You might want to look at this. So she's sitting there, not looking too compromised, but with this chest x ray. Super my film, maybe a bit of deep softness there, a lot of fuzz in the super my film, it's some root fractures. Let's just hold the sound there. So, this is a uh, right. Lung, new thorax on the thorax. Good, good for signage, got B lines, got holes on the screen. And the M bone shows a seashore sign, that's great. And then it's a left lung, new thorax on the thorax. Shows a new thorax. She's got a barcode sign on M bone, too easy. A fast scan, that's right, quadrant, no free fluid. No peritoneum on this view. And this is her left upper quadrant, keep me here, screen, diaphragm, and it's great big, black, pointy, rural infusion. Instant answers with ultrasound. This is a different patient, this is a post operative patient that came to the ED 24 hours after uh, removing the logo consistently. With that we have a positive fast scan. It's her left upper quadrant in the same patient. I think you've seen it now. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> yeah. When you identify a positive fast scan in the helicopter and they're hypotensive, will you then deliver that patient directly to the operating theater instead of the emergency room? Yeah, we try. Uh, and uh, most of the trauma centers will allow us to do that. Yeah. Sometimes there will be patient failures outside our control. But yeah, we pretty much do A and B pre hospital, we'll do a rapid seat intubation. Cost at to have the patient anesthetized and packaged and slitted because uh, we have time to do that. Uh, so if they need a laparotomy and say anything we can't do, there's no point in not taking them directly to the operating theatre. And there's terminology we use for that, like code crimson, means we need to go straight to the theatre. Okay, so we've covered sources of bleeding in the peritoneum, pericardium, and pleural space. And that's going to cover a new thorax. But it's not enough just to watch lectures and new books. Um, it's a practical skill we need to get hands on. And uh, so we'll have an opportunity to practice that shortly. If there are any questions you have later, um, I'll put, uh, you can email me here, so you can either die or come find me. And I'll put some of the slides and images on my website, which you can use that stop Thanks.
Thanks, Cliff. So this is our first hands-on session. Uh, we'll start, we'll go from 10 to noon, and then at noon we've got lunch uh, delivered right out in the atrium. So there will be stations, there will be one in this room, uh, and then actually in every room on the bottom floor will be some of the kitchen. Uh, but we'll be we'll be here uh, to go over trauma, so uh, good effort. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I just got to the uh, slides that Well, I checked it myself. I went through the rule work before, but then I just noticed it on. So I'll check the slide out one of them. Yeah. So that's why I've got it a bit short. It's been through some black slides.